Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something truly cool <laughs> this time. All right. Um, I'm starting another series uh, called Christians Really Don't Know Their Bibles. This is part one. Um, again, I don't do a series like this to show what I know about the future. That's I do have a humble spirit. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this, trying to approach this from an angle, which is really going to, to get you to think about your understanding of Father's Word. For example, all of these verses, these little one-liners that we see in the verses of the book of Psalms. In, in, in part one, I'm going to use Psalm 147.3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You know, um, a Sunday school class in church will typically take a verse like this and just mention about the power that we have uh, available to us to access from God the Father because we go through Jesus Christ, His Son, and we can have healing in our lives today, and uh, uh, we can replace sadness with joy. And there's so many different ways that pastors will give sermons on a, on a verse like this. They'll just take it and run with it and say all kinds of truths about the power of Jesus and Almighty God and, and what we can access once we become uh, you know, adopted into the family of Yah, the Holy One of Israel. And they probably won't even mention His name. They'll just say the Lord. But, but yet they'll never, ever, ever give the whole truth. And, and they don't, people, uh, and I'm not talking just about clergy, it can just be someone leading a, a Sunday school class. Um, they'll never give the actual event that that verse is talking about and give some understanding to it. So we got to get back to our Bibles. And I hope that this study, which uh, is about the healing and the binding up of the wounds that occurs when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. See, there's not enough talk today about the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. And in fact, the church is, is all divided. You know, do we just go to heaven and the earth is done with? I mean, I don't know. A large percentage of the church don't even believe in a millennial, one true 1,000 year reign of Jesus here on physical planet earth. I mean, it's ridiculous how much confusion about the Word of God exists in the church today. So this little study uh, about what does Psalm 147.3 really mean? What is it talking about? Is it just, just something, just a generality? Is that a word? Or is it actually speaking of an event in the future that's soon to take place? You, you see where, where I'm going with this? And I've got four great passages and if you notice, Psalm 147, verses 1 through 3, matches Malachi 4, 1 through 3, Hosea 6, 1 through 3, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. And Psalm, uh, yes, and Psalm 147, 1 through 3, matches those three. So I've got four passages for you. And combined, when you combine them all, you understand exactly what that one verse in Psalm 147 is talking about, and you may take notice, you should take notice, that that verse in Psalm 147 uh, is spoken of, you know, that, that it sounds like it's rolling off of the tongues of Jesus in the New Testament, because it is, but yet nobody really, you know, understands what event in the future it's talking about. Yes, we can access the throne now, absolutely and get our healing. But but what is this event primarily speaking of that's in the future? And these three ver uh, three passages combined with Psalm 147 gives us our answer and serves as an example of how we really don't know our Bible. And clergy need to get back to the Word of God. And I know they're super busy taking care of so many people. 
And everyone has so many problems that a, a, a shepherd really doesn't even have time each week to read the Word of God. So I'm not the enemy of, of clergy. I'm just saying, and it's not my place to, to, to say any words of chastisement against you. It's not. Who am I? You know, who am I? I've never graduated the seminary. I've never shepherded a flock. So what right do I have? But my, I do this out of love, brothers and sisters. The time is short. And you go, there's, there's going to be events. Here we go. Listen to this. There's going to be events that will soon take place in Israel, to Israel, and you need to understand whose side you should be on. Because you're going to see great Christian persecution occur in Israel. And you're going to see um, people come against Israel. And America, for example, is going to be divided on how they should react to what's going on in Israel. Do you see where I'm going with this? And, and let's tell the whole picture. Zechariah 13 and Ezekiel 4 and 5 say that two out of every three people in Israel is about to die. And Isaiah 1 tells you why. And I'm not calling for that. And, but I am warning you that don't you dare uh, smile when it happens. And you might say, why in the world, brother, would I smile if I see two out of every three children in Israel die? Why would you say that? Why would I smile? Well, I'm just, you got to be careful and realize what's about to happen in Israel. No, you should not smile. Just the opposite. You shouldn't smile when any children dies, obviously, anywhere on the planet. But there's going to be this massive Christian persecution in Tel Aviv, in Haifa, in Jerusalem. It's coming. When the foolish shepherd, also called the worthless shepherd in Israel, sides with the coming caliph in the Middle East and makes this peace agreement. And there's going to be this Christian persecution. Then you're going to reach a point at the fifth seal when Satan's going to enter this man. You'll have the abomination of desolation event in Jerusalem. And the next thing you know, him and his false prophet are working signs, wonders, and miracles to, to deceive everyone except for the elect, blessed, chosen people who have the Holy Spirit residing in them and, and teaching them. So things are going to get really confusing. Do you see where I'm going with this? Things in the next 10, 15 years, one day you might be pro-Israel, and the next day there's a part of you going, wait a minute, look what they're doing to Christian children. No, oh, I'm anti-Israel now. So you've got to be careful. You need to see Father's plan. You need to understand Father's plan. Where is he taking the nation of Israel? Are they really his chosen people today, not just in the Old Testament? You know, what's his plan for Israel? What's his plan for the Gentile followers of his son? So you've got to know the whole picture. And this study of these verses one through three in these four books, in these chapters of the four books, makes it really clear what Jesus is coming back to do. And if someone asked you, okay, Jesus is coming back someday. What is he coming back to do? You might be able to name one of the things he's coming back to do. You might be able to name two things that he's coming back to do. But can you name all of the things Jesus is coming back to do? And you might say, no, why should I? The Bible probably doesn't even tell us all of the things Jesus is going to come back to do. Yeah, it does. That's my point tells you everything Jesus is going to come back to do. He has several things on his list of things to do. And he wants it taught and he wants it understood. He doesn't want you to read over a verse in Psalm 147 like this, which is found all over the New Testament. He doesn't want you to read that and be ignorant of what it, he's really talking about. And it's real important that you understand. Because how... You might say, well, as long as I, I believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter what I think about the nation of Israel. 
you better be careful because the final vine dresser who has the ultimate decision on whether you get to remain part of his family or not for eternity is God the Father, the Holy One of Israel. And Israel is has and always will be the apple of his eye. And he's going to do a work with Israel in the last days that's going to bring him glory for his holy name. Not necessarily for Israel. But if if you tell if you teach each other, as long as you've got Jesus, it doesn't matter what you think of Israel or do to Israel, it does. And if you have the Holy Spirit residing in you and teaching you about God, the Holy One of Israel, and His people, Israel, and how He deals with them and what He thinks of them, if you have the Holy Spirit truly in you, and not all who profess the name of Jesus do, then you might say, well, how do you know, brother? Because there's a great falling away that's coming. The Bible says that in 2 Thessalonians 2. And John chapter 6 tells you about the first falling away at Jesus' first coming, especially John 6, verse 66. Did you know that? You need to learn about this second coming falling away. The falling away that happens prior to the second coming of Jesus, not after he comes. This falling away will be the three and a half years prior to his coming, when the fake Messiah is running around being worshipped by most of the planet. Do you understand? So if you want really love your children, you're going to teach them about what is about to happen. And maybe you're in your 80s, and you don't think you're going to be alive when Jesus comes in 5 years, 10 years, 15 years. What does it matter to you? Well, how about teaching your grandchildren? Don't you think your grandchildren, or possibly even your children, are going to be alive when the end of the age comes? And you might say, well, the planet's going to blow up and it doesn't matter. You, as long as you have Jesus, nothing matters. Well, first of all, the planet's not going to blow up. Jesus is going to use this planet for a thousand years after uh, he comes. So don't be lazy. Why read the word of God and not understand it? See, that's why people don't enjoy reading the Bible. They have to put it on their cal calendar and go, okay, things to do this week. I'm going to spend 30 minutes a day in the Word of God. I'm going to start at Genesis 1, and I'm going to work my way through to Revelation by the end of the year. And uh, it'll make God happy, and I'm sure I'll get something out of it. The reason why you're not getting anything out of the Word of God is because you don't understand it. There needs to be truth and understanding taught to the church. What does a verse like this really mean? Okay, here we go. Here's what I've got for you. Please share this preview, download it, and share it with the brethren and make it part of your, your small group studies. This short study series is not meant to show what I know about the future, but it is meant to show the church what the church does not know about the uh, period called the millennium. When's the last time you even heard that taught in church? You think that doesn't anger Almighty God? You think it doesn't anger Jesus, God the Son, the Son of Man? You think it doesn't anger Him that His Word, it, or half of His Word, or a fourth of His Word isn't taught in church? This verse in the book of Psalms is a great example. Question, is this verse... Psalm 147.3, simply talking about the power and desire of Jesus to heal and comfort his followers in general, or is it talking about a specific event in the future that is soon to take place? And the verse reads, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Again, is that a specific event? Or is it a combination of we can access it now, but it's also talking about an event in the future? What do you think? If you choose a future event as your answer, is your answer referring to the resurrection rapture, which makes Jews and Gentiles immortals, not all of them, just the chosen ones, or is your answer 
talking about the mortal nation of Israel left alive at the end of the battle of the great day of God Almighty at the first few days of the millennial period after the pouring of the seventh bowl. You know, just the fact that if you ask someone what is the battle of the great day of God Almighty, they can't even tell you. If those who, who got an idea of what it is, and you say, okay, when does it occur? They don't even know to say that after the pouring of the seventh bowl. And if, they, and if you ask them, well, is that the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, or is that the first few days of the millennium? They can't even answer that. If you were to ask them how many people in Israel alive today will be dead by the end of the seven trumpet judgments, they have no idea. And they almost think it's blasphemy to even say Zechariah 3 is a, I mean, Zechariah 13 and Ezekiel 5 and Ezekiel 4 are about to take place. Israel wouldn't even let me into their country. I couldn't even go there on vacation if I s preach such things. Well, how about warning the apple of God's eye about what Father is about to do in Israel? Again, if you don't understand why two out of every three people in Israel are about to die, you need to read Isaiah 1, and then you go to Zechariah 13, Ezekiel 4, and Ezekiel 5, Ezekiel 6, Ezekiel 7. Find out what Father is about to do to the nation of Israel, the last generation of his people. And they are his people, and they always will be his people. Remember what Romans 9 and Romans 11 teaches the Gentile followers of Jesus Christ. You are being grafted on to the spot on the tree of life. All right, that green olive tree with lovely and good fruit that Jesus is the root of. You are being grafted onto a spot where Father is cutting off from the land of the living Israelis that are actually DNA of Jacob. He's cutting off a lot of them, and he's replacing them with Gentile followers of Jesus Christ. They'll be grafted on into their spot on the tree. Now, when it's all said and done, what percentage of the branches on the tree are actually DNA from the seed of Jacob and which ones are not, I have no idea. And it doesn't matter because we're all children, heirs of Almighty God, Yah, the Holy One of Israel. And how many people even know the name of God the Father? I just call him Father. Yeah, I hear you, but he, since he gives his name in the Bible in more than one place, why not teach it every now and then? Well, because it sounds like he's the God of Israel in the future and not the God of the followers of Jesus. How about teaching what the Word of God says? Don't worry about your opinions, okay? I know sometimes I say things that sounds like I'm pro-Israel, and the next minute it sounds like I'm saying things that are anti-Israel. Well, when you read the Word of God, it's going to sound like that. Father gets very upset with his chosen people. And you might say, well, why did he choose them to begin with? So he can have servants. He had to choose a people on the planet to serve him as personal servants in his personal headquarters of his kingdom. It didn't matter which people he chose. Everyone else was going to be jealous. He could have chose people from South Africa, Zimbabwe. I mean, you know, you get what I'm saying? Um, people from Baghdad. I mean, it just didn't matter. Whichever people he chose to be his personal servants throughout eternity, it didn't matter. Everyone else was going to be jealous. Well, he chose the offspring of Jacob. Did you know that? All of them, they all start out on the tree of life. But a lot of them are going to be chopped off. And, and then followers of Jesus, gen, a lot of them Gentiles, will be grafted onto their spot on the tree and serve as personal servants. And, you, and then that brings up the question, are we talking about immortals serving God during the millennium or mortals serving God during the millennium? Both. Both. The kingdom of, of God, which is actually the name of it, is actually found in 
in verse 8 of Micah 4. Did you know that, that the coming kingdom has a name? And the name is given to you in Micah chapter 4. And you might say, ah, that's Old Testament. So, it's still the same author as the New Testament. What do you mean, Micah wrote Micah 4? No, he didn't. He might have put pen to paper, but he's not the one who wrote it. The author of the Old Testament is the author of the New Testament. And they both talk about future events most of the time. Hallelujah. So, if you choose a future event as your answer, it is referring to the resurrection, or is it referring to the resurrection rapture, which makes Jews and Gentiles immortals? Or, if you choose a future event as your answer, is it talking about the mortal nation of Israel left alive at the end of the battle, the great day of God Almighty, to start the millennium? Again, are we talking about immortals or mortals if you realize that verse 3 in Psalm 147 is really talking about a future event, primarily? So what's your answer? Well, let's get the right answer. Here we go. Uh, Malachi 4, verses 1 through 3 is the best place to start to understand Psalm 147. Do you even know where Malachi, uh, the book of Malachi is in the Old Testament? Again, I don't throw questions out there to you to try to lift myself up. Because I'm, I'm, I, there's a lot about the Bible I don't know. Okay, there, there is. So I, and I realize that. So I'm asking these questions with a humble spirit. Because it's real important that you know these things. I'm trying to get you to to stay focused, to stay motivated, not to turn this off, okay? I need you to feel like you're about to be fed, because you are. And I want you to stick around. <laughs> Taste it, chew it up, and swallow it. Hallelujah. Malachi, the book of Malachi, is the last book in the entire Old Testament. And it's all about the coming of Jesus. It is. The Old Testament ends with talking about the return of Jesus Christ at the end of this age? Yes. Isn't that wonderful? And how else should the Old Testament end? In fact, the majority of the Old Testament is, talks about Jesus' second coming. Did you know that? And if you didn't, why aren't our churches teaching it? All right, let's read a little bit. This is the first three verses. This isn't the whole chapter. Now, every one of these passages, Malachi, Hosea, Isaiah, and Psalms that I have for you today, you need, after this lesson, to go read the entire chapter. Take you about five minutes, ten minutes per chapter. Go read the whole chapter to get the whole understanding of this short study. Please, I'm working hard for you. At least take the time to do that. And the lesson will be twice as good as it will be if you don't read the entire chapter. For behold, Malachi 4, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Okay, 2 Peter uh, 3 should be coming to mind. Verse 12. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. That's real important what you just read because it just talks about millions of people, if not billions of people on this planet are going to die during uh, the seven trumpet judgments, but primarily at the return of Jesus Christ. And you might say, hey, wait a minute, I thought this is about the healing and the binding up of the wounds that Jesus causes at his return. Why are you reading about millions or billions of people dying at the hand of Jesus. Which is it? It's both. Do you understand? Both are going to happen. Remember what's going on here. You're going to have the mark of the beast going out. All of the world will be deceived except the elect. 
Now, there are going to be fence sitters. People don't realize that. There's going to be fence sitters who don't take the mark. I'm talking about the seven continents. There's going to be people who don't take the mark, but don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, and they will be permitted to live during, during the seven trumpet judgments and the battle of the great day of God Almighty that begins the moment Jesus returns, which is the early days of the millennium. There will be people left alive from every continent who are mark free but if if you take the mark of the beast during the millennium excuse me during the uh, uh, three and a half years when Satan is is uh, working him and his false prophet working signs wonders and miracles to deceive if possible even the elect and making war against the followers of Jesus Christ did you know a war is coming and the war is against the followers of Jesus Christ and you might say well I thought this is the sudden destruction on Israel well, that's going to happen too. But Revelation 12, Revelation 13 talks about this 1260 days, 42 months, where Satan is here and he is his number one mission is to make war against those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's trying to stop Jesus' inheritance. He's trying to stop Jesus' kingdom from coming. He is the arch nemesis of Jesus. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Satan is the wicked counselor. And Almighty God possesses the body of Jesus, and Satan possesses the man of sin. Who comes first? In the next 10 or 15 years, who comes first? Satan or Jesus? Satan comes first. Deceiving the world. And he ensures that Christians who haven't gone anywhere yet, there's no rapture at the first seal, there's no rapture at the sixth seal, no one gets raptured until the resurrection, and that is when Almighty God raises up his Son. When Jesus arises, that's the day of your adoption, that's the day that you get your rest, your crown of righteousness, your unspeakable joy, your blessed hope. That's when you get it, when he arises in glory, coming with his mighty angels on the last day of this age of Satan. And half of you right now are probably shutting me off. <laughs> half of 20 is 10. 10 people right now are shutting me down. Oh, he's a post-tripper. Yeah, so is the word of God. I wish we were out of here before all this happens. Why do you think that he makes war on those who have the testimony of Jesus for 42 months? Oh, that's the uh, people who become Christians after we're gone. They see our uh, Nike tennis shoes laid on the ground, and they realize they missed the boat. <laughs> no, brothers and sisters, you've been, you've been taught wrong. That's not when the rapture occurs. It's part of the mustering of the Lord's army for battle. And... Uh, that might be a little bit easier for people who have uh, some military experience to understand. The rapture and the resurrection occur at the same time, and it's in Isaiah 13, verses 3 and 4. That's the rapture. It's Zechariah 9, 14. It's Isaiah 13. That's the rapture, the mustering of the Lord's armies of heaven to trample the wicked. You might say, Jesus doesn't need my help. I sing in the church choir. Why does Jesus need my help to trample the wicked? Well, he doesn't, but it brings him pleasure. And when you're coming down on the necks of your enemies, why? Because they took your head eight months earlier. Guess what? It's the day of vengeance. And you might say, well, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Yes. And he controls all of his weapons of indignation during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Starting with the wine press in the Kidron Valley and the Jordan River Valley. And then what happens? He goes out to all the threshing floors in the Middle East, says Isaiah 27, 12. And he brings you with him. Now, does everyone who gets a new immortal body fight with Jesus? No. Many are singing in the choir playing in the band, dancing. Hallelujah. All right, maybe we're going a little too deep for this lesson. 
So, Malachi 4, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. Those who take the mark of the beast will be identified for destruction. The accusers of the brethren, the perjurers, the blasphemers, those who are just uh, uh, persecuting the followers of Jesus Christ. And the day which is coming shall burn them up. Doesn't mean the earth is ending that day. It doesn't. But all of the marked people all on all seven continents, not just those gathered to the mountains of Israel, will die that day. That will leave them neither root nor branch. So a lot of these are, are people in the Middle East who are determined to take Jerusalem, bring it into Israel, and stop Christianity in its tracks. And you see Jesus coming back with a hit list of which peoples on the planet he's really going to focus on in his threshing zone. That's all of the kindle the fire, send the fire, burden against, word of the Lord against passages in the Old Testament. It's Israel's evil neighbors and surrounding peoples. Now, every one of these nations I'm mentioning or alluding to have lots of Christians in them. I'm not talking about them. In fact, they're going to be killed. They better get out now because Israel's neighbors are really going to focus on killing all the Christians within their own country. You better get out now because when that day comes, things are going to move fast and airports are going to be closed and passports are going to be revoked and you're not going to get out. You better get out now, followers of Jesus. Hallelujah. Verse 2, but to you who fear my name, right, God, the Holy One of Israel and his son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of righteousness, talking about glorified Jesus, shall arise with healing in his wings. Father's actually bringing him. And Jesus will sit to the right hand of the power and you'll see the face of Jesus. Of course, we'll be up there in the clouds with him, but those below which is the majority of them are wicked. Some of them are fence sitters or foolish versions, which are mark free and shall be permitted to live out the millennium and live out the days of their lives and make beautiful babies during the millennium for Jesus. And there'll be babies made on all seven continents of the planet. But the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings and you shall go out like and, and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Okay. Is this talking about people who have just received an immortal body getting fat? No, this is talking about the foolish virgins of Israel who are not glorified, but yet they remain faithful to Yah, the Holy One of Israel, and do not take the mark of the beast. And they did not persecute followers of Jesus Christ. Okay. They may have just been humble and in hiding and praying to Yah and not understanding. Maybe they never really heard the gospel of Jesus. And they'll be permitted to live out the rest of their days in their mortal bodies. And they'll be part of the bride of Christ. Did you know that? The bride of Christ is not just made up 100% of immortals. That's not the plan of God. Jesus shall rule over not just immortals from Jerusalem, but he shall rule over mortals and his people. A lot of them will be mortals. And he will gather them. That's the one third in Ezekiel 13. He gathers them out of slavery who are not glorified, but yet they were faithful to Yah. And he brings their foolish, foolish virgins because they didn't realize their Messiah, Jesus. But they didn't necessarily re, uh, um, what's the right word? They don't deny its truths. They just never really heard the gospel. There's people in Israel, especially young people, who really haven't heard the gospel of Jesus. They haven't uh, rejected. That's the word I was trying to think of. They haven't rejected the gospel. They just never really heard it. Now, there's many people in Israel that have. And they'll probably take the mark of the beast, and they'll be the ones persecuting the followers of Jesus. 
and the host of heaven, the angels, Almighty God, everyone's taking uh, notes on how everyone's going to act. Do you have Jesus in your heart? No. Did you persecute the word of God and followers of Jesus? Well, no. Okay, then there's a chance you might get to be alive. But remember, one third of Israel is going to be taken into slavery. Two out of three are about to die during the uh, time of Jacob's trouble, which is the sixth seal through the sixth bowl. Jesus arises at the seventh bowl. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet of the day that I do this, says the Lord. Jesus, think of it like this. Yes, yes, Jesus has immortals and mortals as his weapons of indignation. Other scriptures prove that. But if you were to say verse 3 here in Malachi 4 is primarily talking about uh, the foolish virgins trampling on the dead bodies, which are really burnt to a crisp because of the fire and brimstone that comes out of the mouth of Jesus, you are correct. Okay, there's many desolations are determined for the time of Jacob's trouble during the battle of the great day of God Almighty when Jesus and all of his weapons of indignation to include the mortal ten king armies in Revelation 17 who will come against the beast cities and burn them with fire. So Jesus is using all of his weapons, immortal and mortal, mortal Israel, mortal ten kings, um, you know, the my mighty ones who rejoice at his exaltation. He's also using his immortal, exceedingly great army that stands on their feet from the last 6,000 years. I mean, uh, Almighty God is using. Now, he could, Jesus could speak one word, and they all just fall over or turn to salt. Yes, he could do that, but that's not Father's plan. There's going to be a battle, and there's going to be time for the wicked to feel shame. Isaiah 28 says one beast city will perish before another beast city, and that other beast city who hasn't perished yet will get a report where Jesus is heading next. And they'll be terrorized because they're about to die at the hands of Almighty God. Did you know that? The Old Testament is full of these passages. And it's, Isaiah 28 is a great place to go to see Jesus return and start the battle of the great day of God Almighty. His trampling, his threshing. And how the battle of the great day of God Almighty will not only last more than an hour, it'll last for days. Did you know that? As Jesus is visiting, he wants these enemies and adversaries of his to understand they're about to die. And he wants them time to think about it and to fill their shame. So that the world knows not to mess with Jesus, not to mess with Israel during the thousand year period of the millennium. And he will rule with a rod of iron. Have you been taught that in church? You know, get out of your happy place. Oh, we're going to heaven and that's all we need to know. Okay, you don't honor the word of God when you teach such things. How about teaching the millennium properly? How about teaching the battle of the great day of God Almighty when Jesus threshes from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River? And then the ten kings head south down the Nile River Basin. In Isaiah 18, they meet up with Ethiopian Sudan, and all the marked ones from those nations shall be destroyed. How come we don't teach the Bible properly? What about the continent of North America? Well, Jesus is going to punish the world for its evil. It'll be the worst earthquake of all time when all the cities are on fire. The mantle of the earth will be shaking. But Isaiah 66 says that there's going to be people left alive from all seven continents, and they'll be told what happened in the Middle East. And everyone's like, see, all flesh shall see the Lord, the coming of the Lord. No, you won't. That's talking about in the wine press. That's talking about in the wedding hall of Matthew 22. You need to read your Bibles, brothers and sisters. Isaiah 66, 18 through 21 tells you people outside 
of the of of the threshing zone of Isaiah 27 12 will happen will they'll know that that Almighty God is here but they will not see him they'll be and then those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved does that mean granted immortality at that moment no if you're marked free at the seventh bowl if you're marked free and your hands are lifted up and you're calling upon the name of Jesus you might be permitted to live and enter the millennium in your mortal body. Hallelujah. So you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So the day of healing of the, of the brokenhearted and the binding up of the wounds is in reference to Israel, mortal Israel, foolish virgins who didn't persecute the Christians. They just tried to hide. They didn't. They never really rejected the gospel. They've never really heard it. They're going to be permitted to live. Uh, one third of them are in slavery and they'll be brought back. Don't forget Isaiah 4 and Isaiah 6 talks about the 10% holy stump that'll be hiding in the mountains of Israel. They'll be brought out from hiding. You have the, uh, the, the, the certain number of people in Jerusalem that Jesus will allowed to escape to Bethany 2.5 miles east through the valley made in the Mount of uh, Olives just before Jesus blows fire on Jerusalem. The bundle tears in Jerusalem made up of Jews and Gentiles, primarily Gentiles that surround the nation of Israel. So hopefully you're starting to see where I'm going with this. Where the, where the Lord is going with this. Let's read Hosea 6, 1 through 3, one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. It actually tells you when your rapture is going to occur. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. Okay. Now that, in verse 1, it's really talking about uh, when the Lord sets his hand a second time to recover one-third of Israel, which is considered a remnant, those left alive, two out of every three are going to die, that one-third will be taken into slavery. Don't forget about the 10% holy stump that we rarely talk about, hiding in the mountains of Israel, maybe even down in Petra or the fords of the Arnon or whatever. But... Verse 1 is really saying, okay, the word is getting out to those who are being freed from the beast cities. Let's go back to Jerusalem. The Lord is there, and he's going to turn us into a great nation. Uh, be motivated. Get your spiritual healing. Get your motivation. Let's get our behinds back to Jerusalem and help Jesus build, rebuild Jerusalem. Okay, that's what verse 1 is really talking about, but it also is talking about the day that he comes and changes mortals to immortals as well, those who have a personal relationship with him. But verse 2 tells you when it's going to happen. After two days, or after 2,000 years, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. So you might say, okay, you're confusing me. You're sending me mixed signals, brother. Is the reviving and raising up just mortal Israel only who will become a great nation and help Jesus rule the planet? Or is this talking about the resurrection and the rapture? Well, great question. It's talking about both. It's the coming of the kingdom. So many bodies are going to be immortal. So many bodies are going to be mortals ruling with Jesus over other mortals from Jerusalem. So it's both. That's why it's confusing sometimes. That's why shepherds read Ezekiel 37, that exceedingly great army that stands on its feet. In one minute, they're saying that's the resurrection of the dead to life. And then the next minute, the shepherds go on, well, that's the nation of Israel during the millennium coming back from slavery and helping the Lord rule over the nations. It's both. That's why shepherds, to include myself, used to bounce back and forth. Which is it? It's both. It's his kingdom, which comprises of immortals and mortals. And you might say, well, what's the roles of the immortals? Well, he doesn't tell us a whole lot. We know we're going to be a uh, priest to not only Jesus, but also God the Father, who's going to be up in heaven. 
in the spiritual realm. So we're going to be transitioning back and forth, or maybe some of us will spend most of our time at the throne room of Almighty God, Father, and some of us will spend our time taking over uh, governatorial roles in North America or Europe or Russia. And if that sounds strange to you, two chapters after this is Psalm 149. You need to check it out. You're going to be removing those immortals will be removing people from power. And also mortal Israel will be removing people from their neighbors uh, from power. With using a two-edged sword. Hallelujah. Verse 2 of Hosea 6, After two days he will revive us. I should have made that purple. On the third day he will raise us up. And you might say, well, brother, you just said after two days was after 2,000 years. What's on the third day? It means the very first established day of the next 1,000-year period. Jesus had left us 2,000 years ago, but when only Father knows exactly the moment, the day, the year, the week, when Jesus ascended to heaven, it's established, his return is established. And Father doesn't even have to send Jesus on that exact day, but that gives you the general timeline. But isn't it interesting that people don't know, don't even agree on the day that Jesus ascended? There's a reason for that. Father may want to send Jesus on that day. He may, but he said he's going to send him a few days early. Get it? So it's probably established for 2,000 days, but he can send, he could bring Jesus back a few days early. And no one knows for sure what day, other than Father, that he'll say, the number of martyrs have been reached, let's ride. And I may have just blew your mind with what I just said. But you need to understand what's meant by the fifth seal passage of the book of Revelation, found in Revelation 6. There's a number of martyrs that Father's looking for be with the shedding of the innocent blood by Satan before Father awards the kingdom to Jesus and his beautiful bride in Daniel 7 at the blowing of the seventh trumpet by the seventh angel, not by Jesus. The seventh trumpet is not blown by the Lord. The, the trumpet blown by the Lord in Zechariah 9.14 occurs at the seventh bowl, and it's a go-to-war trumpet. Attack suddenly in a moment, swiftly, speedily, in the twinkling of an eye. Attack! And Jesus uses all of his weapons of indignation. People have no idea what the return of Jesus Christ is really going to be like. Will it be unspeakable joy during the battle? Yes. And that blows people's minds. Well, not every person changed to an immortal being is going to be killing the wicked. They're not. Read Psalm 110, only volunteers. And a lot of these volunteers are people who have fought for the Lord in, in thousands of years ago. you got to understand that. It's not just the followers of Jesus Christ alive today that's going to make up the immortal armies of heaven. We're talking about people who fought for Father Yah 3,000, 4,000 years ago. And you might say, how can that be? They didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. No, they didn't. But Father chose them to be part of the family. The, in the entire family, the entire assembly of the congregation of Israel will kill at twilight. And you might say, brother, now what are you talking about? We know the hour of the day of Jesus' arrival, not to the minute, but we know the hour. And you say, the Bible says no man knows the hour. What do you think Zechariah 14, 7 and Isaiah 17, 14 mean? It gives meaning to the Old Testament passages talking about the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. That all uh, didn't just point to Jesus' first coming. It also points to Jesus' second coming when he serves as high priest and offers a sacrifice to his father who's bringing him on the cherub. And guess what the sacrifice is? It's the bulls of Bashan, bulls of Basira, Jordan, all right, made up of men and their actual bulls, oxen, goats, rams, 
If that sounds totally new to you, go read Ezekiel 39. The birds and the beasts are going to feast on these bodies of the marked ones. And the foolish virgins are going to be feasting on the animals brought by those armies to Jerusalem when they're trying to take it the last moments. And they do take Israel. Israel falls, according to Zechariah 14. And then there's that few days when um, the wicked are going through all the houses, climbing in the windows, looking not only for beautiful girls, but they're looking for anyone who doesn't have the mark of their Antichrist. And they're going to be killed or taken into slavery. So Israel will fall for a few days. And then here comes Jesus and all of his weapons of indignation. All right? to attack his adversaries and his enemies, to include Jews who have made a mistake and taken the mark of the beast. They must all die too. <laughs> and if this is all new to you, you're probably thinking, you know, I believe you, but I'm not sure I even want to talk about this in church. Well, I understand. But at some place, at some time, be it at someone's house, at least the men should actually learn the Word of God and what's about to happen. And you better know what your response should be to Israel before Jesus comes. How should you be praying for Israel? Yes. Even when they're persecuting Christians? Yes. Should you be asking Father to forgive them they know not what they do? Yes. If they take the mark of the beast, is Jesus going to kill them? Yes. Should you still pray for them and beg forgiveness for them? Yes. Act like your master would. And you might say, well, he's obviously not praying for them. He's going to kill them. Well, he has to kill them. They have, Israel must be refined. Israel's dross and alloy must be removed, taken away, purged away. Okay, That doesn't mean Jesus enjoys it. It must happen. Maybe it's the command of his father. Father knows best. Whatever it is, pray for Israel, pray for Israel, pray for Israel. Um, can Israel stop father's plan? Yes. What has Israel got to do so that when the scroll is opened, the day of the Lord brings Jesus instead of the Antichrist army to cause sudden destruction? What, is, what does Israel have to do during the fifth seal? Don't persecute the Christians. Bow before Jesus. Call upon him as their Messiah. And denounce the Antichrist possessed by Satan. And do not take his mark even if it means their own lives. If the majority of Israel's leadership, if the majority of the nation of Israel did that, the time of Jacob's trouble would not come. Here would come Jesus. They would look up and see the face of him who sits on the throne. Yes, the sixth seal passage of Revelation 6 should be coming to mind. And instead of the time of Jacob's trouble bringing Gog the Assyrian's hired razor flying the bee army to pass through the mountains of Israel, Daniel 11:40b, instead of Gog the Assyrian coming to kill, steal, and destroy, it would be their Messiah who would be coming in the clouds. Okay, not riding on a horse on planet Earth, on terra firma. If Jesus came at the sixth seal, seventh seal, first trumpet, it would be in the air with, on the cherub of the Lord brought by his father, and it would be on fire in the sky. Okay? Don't let the devil deceive you. Some man riding a white horse, either at the first seal or the sixth and seventh seals, is not Jesus. You're going to know when Jesus shows up. First of all, There'll be the latter rain. There'll be hail the size of a uh, hundred pounds. There'll be uh, the worst earthquake of all time. So, is Israel going to pass the test? No. Father even tells us that. He gives them the opportunity. He leaves the door open. That's how the Old Testament ends in Malachi 4. If they repent, he'll relent. But then he says, now let me go ahead and tell you. They're not going to repent. And I'm not going to relent. They must be purged. So he tells us that. But you should be praying. That Malachi 4 is not just for Israel, present day Israel. It's also to tell you how to pray. You pray for 
Israel to do the right thing. You stand in the gap and try to stop, all right, the wrath of God on his people, which has to come first before the wrath of God is delivered on the enemies of Israel and the enemies of Yah, the Holy One of Israel, and his son. Hallelujah. So, after two days means after 2,000 years as far as I'm as concerned. Okay, and, and, it, and, it, and when did he ascend? Well, no one knows. Most scholars say between 30 A.D. and 33 A.D. Guess what? It's just 10 years away. 13 years away. But don't forget the seven years of the time, uh, excuse me, the seven years of the 70th week of Daniel has to start seven years before that date. What's my point? I believe, this is just me talking, that we are going to begin the 70th week of Daniel, which shall last for seven years before the return of the real Messiah, Jesus, is going to start somewhere between 2023 and 2025, putting the first seal of the book of Revelation occurring around January 2023, Excuse me, January 2024, January 2025, or January 2026. Can I prove it? No. But that's what I get so far from the Word of God. I'm curious what you think. Is it wrong to pick high watch years? Is it wrong to teach the Word of God using your opinion about high watch years? I don't think so. I think it does more good than harm. Yes, it can turn a bunch of people off when the date comes and nothing happened. But you know what? Those people probably didn't have the Holy Spirit residing in them anyways, or they would have understood what you were trying to do. But see, here's the difference between me and some other high watch year setter. I don't tell you that Jesus is going to rapture you at a certain time. I really don't. Because I'm a post-trib rapture understander, not believer, I understand the Bible. It's going to happen at the rising of Jesus at the seventh bowl. Because I understand that, I might say, hey, I think the 70th week is going to start this particular year or this group of years. Here's what to watch for. And I also tell you that when this happens, you know it has begun. See, that's the difference between me and someone who's a pre-tribber, who's deceived, it says, Jesus is going to come this October. Get ready. Oh, get excited, brothers and sisters. You're about to get your new body. You only got a couple more months. You know, see, there's a big difference between that person who doesn't understand the Word of God and doesn't understand that the loosing of the first seal, you need to watch for it. And what it is, is the covenant of death. And mentioned in Isaiah 28, 18, that's about to be signed by the worthless shepherd, the final prime minister of the nation of Israel, he'll sign it with <clears throat> the covenant with many of his evil neighbors and surrounding peoples, and it'll be signed in the city of Mosul, says Nahum chapter 1, when that caliph shall arise riding on the white horse and going out conquering and to conquer. All right? See the difference between me and a pre-trib rapture date setter? I'm telling you, I believe that there are uh, high watch years based on Jesus' first coming and the established after two days second coming, but seven years earlier, this will be the sign. So my point is, if I say the first seal is going to occur either January 2024, January 2025, or January 2026, and that's when that agreement will be signed with the leadership of Israel and its neighbors in Mosul, Iraq, if I tell you that, when that date comes and it doesn't happen, it's not like um, it's not like I had told you that you were about to get your change. No, I'm, I'm telling you what to watch for. Seven years before Jesus raptures those who belong to him. Seven years early, I'm telling you this is what's going to happen Watch for it. Jesus told you in Revelation 3, I command you to watch. So this day does not take you like a thief. What day is going to take the world like a thief? The day of the Lord, which is the contents of the scroll. And you might say, brother, 
Now you're confused. The day of the Lord doesn't start till the seventh bowl return of Jesus. Eh, wrong. That is the day of the Lord. To be more specific, it's the great day of the Lord during the battle of the great day of God Almighty when the great trumpet is blown. Brothers and sisters, the day of the Lord begins when the seventh seal is loosed, which is the same afternoon the sixth seal is loosed. Do we know that the, the time, Jerusalem time of the day when the sixth seal is loosed? Yes, it's given to you in multiple places, especially Amos chapter 8. It's going to be at exactly 12 o'clock noon. The same day that, uh, same time of the day when Jesus was on the cross and darkness falls, the sixth seal. And guess when the seventh seal is going to be loosed? At three o'clock in the afternoon, Jerusalem time. Yeah, Father's trying to get Israel's attention. You should have picked Jesus. You chose wrong. You bowed before the wrong king. You chose the Antichrist. Uh, you should have chose Jesus. Guess what happens after 30 minutes of silence at 3.30 in the afternoon, Jerusalem time? Sudden destruction. Here comes Gog the Assyrian in Daniel 11.40b, passing through the mountains of Israel with his hired razor flying the B army of uh, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 8, um, Ezekiel 38, and Psalm 83. They're all talking about the one event which is the day the scroll is opened and the day of the Lord is unleashed in the Middle East and on the world. Hallelujah. All right, so uh, verse 2 of Hosea 6, After two days, I believe 2,000 years, he will revive us. But I'm telling you what to watch for. That will happen seven years early. On the third day, and I think that means literally on the third day, but of course it shall be shortened for a few days for the sake of the elect, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Again, that has two meanings. It's talking about immortals, meeting him in the clouds, uh, coming back to life or being raptured. And they're in their new immortal body, meeting him in the clouds, and will rule with him and serve him throughout eternity, not just the millennium. But that also deals with mortal Israel, who's brought back from slavery, will live in Jerusalem with Jesus there. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Break that down. It's good to pursue the knowledge of the going forth coming of the Lord. So don't let anyone tell you, ah, we shouldn't study these things or even, uh, you know, guess or, or worry about such things. It'll come, it, his coming is imminent. No, his coming is not imminent. First of all, he can't even come till after two days. That's why he hasn't come yet. The 2,000 years isn't up. He can't come till the numbers of martyrs have been reached in the fifth seal passage of Revelation chapter 6. Are you catching on? There's things that have to happen before Jesus can come. And you might say, well, brother, you're talking about his second coming, his visible second coming. Yes, I am. There is no first coming as or, or phase one of his second coming. And he doesn't come twice at his second coming. That's a lie, brothers and sisters. I wish it was so. So do you. That's why you agree with it. But it's wrong. He will not come unless Israel bows to Jesus during the fifth seal or... Um, the it is done is screamed at the end of the sixth bowl in Revelation 16, 15. Do you even know what the it is done is talking about? Has nothing, uh, um, let me be careful how I word this. What it means is the purging away and taking away of Israel's dross is complete. It's done. Now we have a clean bride. Jesus is not going to marry a dirty bride. Got it? And, and Christians don't even like to talk about Jesus marrying Israel when he comes. No, he's marrying the followers of Jesus Christ. Don't you get it? You are Israel once you're adopted into the family. Oh, 
Shepherds do not preach that. And they try so hard to separate the nation of Israel from the Gentile followers of Jesus Christ. They try to separate us and they try to say, oh, God's done with that. That we have a new testament. He's got a new plan. He did away with plan A. Now we got a plan B. No, no. Be careful, shepherds. You may have to pay for what you're saying. Don't you dare separate the nation of Israel from the bride of Christ. Don't you do it. It's all about Israel. Was and still is. It's all about Israel. You become Israel. You become the family of Yah, the Holy One of Israel. You become his people, Israel, once you are adopted. And you're not adopted at your moment of salvation. You're adopted on the day of Jesus' coming. Now, you, your soul goes to heaven when you die. Yes. But you have, you're not adopted into the family yet, officially. Not to the wedding day. You know, you're like a, a fiancé that's living in a separate room in your, fa in your future father-in-law's house. But you're not part of the family yet officially until the day of the wedding. And you become Israel. Oh, shepherds don't like to, to teach that. And, and I hate to say it, but a lot of them don't have the Holy Spirit residing in them, even though you th they think they do. I don't wish that on them. And then... The mark of the beast will be unleashed and we'll find out who's really who. You will be shocked by the number of clergy that are going to fall for the Antichrist during the 42 months of the strong delusion. I'm not trying to get you to doubt your, your shepherd. I'm, I'm just stating fact. If anyone... If any clergy, any shepherds try to distance themselves from Israel, the best advice I can give you, child of God, child of Yah, the Holy One of Israel, is to run from that shepherd. Pray for them. Don't talk bad about them. Pray for them. But you need to leave. Go find someone else to be your shepherd. If they try to distance themselves from Israel, and if they don't, often call God the Father, Yah, the Holy One of Israel, or some form of Yah. If they don't, I would advise you to leave that shepherd. I didn't say you had to. Who am I to tell you you had to? But there are shepherds out there who understand the Word of God. Go find one of them. Now me, am I a shepherd? No, I'm too lazy to be a shepherd. Shepherds work harder than anyone else. They have a hundred responsibilities each week. I'm too lazy to be a shepherd. That's why Father never, uh, that wasn't my calling. My calling is to sit here in a lazy boy recliner because I am lazy and, and create these short studies for you. There's a lot of people whose calling, according to Daniel chapter 11, verses 29 through 35, whose calling is simply to teach and give understanding to the 70th week of Daniel. And I'm one of those people. Some people refer to them as the people of understanding in regards to the 70th week. That's my calling. You may have a different calling. But before you hightail it and run from your shepherd, approach him and see if he's open to uh, understanding about the 70th week. He may be. He may be of a humble spirit. But so many of them are so protective of their flock and the gospel of Jesus, which they should be. But the Holy Spirit's not... For whatever reason, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell within them, but the Holy Spirit has not given them that understanding. And I don't know why. I could make assumptions. But again, remember, a lot of Christians are going to be martyred. They're not going to know what to watch for. They're not going to watch for it. 
and they're going to be caught up in the net, in the dragnet, and they're going to be martyred, but they'll be given an opportunity to give a testimony before they're slain. And I don't know for sure, but it may be that those who understand the 70th week better may have a better chance of escaping the wicked in time. Does that make sense? But it may not be God's purpose for all Christians to understand the 70th week and to know what to watch for and to be taught to watch. It may not be his plan for all Christians because a lot of Christians are going to die. And oh, Christians don't want to hear that. And if you if they do hear it, they immediately go, but I won't be here. That'll be tribulation, saints. That's a lie. That's a lie. Stop worrying about people leaving your church if you tell the truth. You don't worry about that. You tell the truth till the day you die. And if your church fires you to shake the dust off of, off of your feet, pray for them and move on. See what God has for you next, but you teach the truth. And that's where our wives can be a problem. Not mine. I'm blessed with a good one. But their wives want the house. They want that second car. You know, they want this for their children. This, this, this. And then the shepherds get caught up with, I can't get fired. I'll lose my health insurance. I'll lose my pension. Uh, I'll probably lose my house and my car. I've got to teach what the um, church wants me to teach uh, but I'll make sure it's within the realm of the Bible teach the truth let the chips fall where they may because guess what here in just a few years you're not going to be able to buy and sell anyways Christians will not be able to use the bank they won't be able to put gas in their car they won't even be able to get a driver's license now a lot of that's going to be going on in the Middle East but it will eventually spread to the whole seven continents Hallelujah. It's good to pursue the knowledge of the coming of the Lord. It's good to pursue it. That's what we're doing here. Hallelujah. Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 3. Let's speed up a little bit here. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Okay, at verse 1 of Isaiah 61, you're like, wow, I feel like I'm reading the New Testament. That's exactly what we're taught in the New Testament that Jesus is going to do and is doing today in the hearts of those who, uh, who are in him. Well, yes, this is for today, but it's primarily for that one event. It's, the, it's for his return when he brings his kingdom in and starts the millennial reign, ruling from Jerusalem with his people Israel, which immortal Gentiles will be grafted onto. you got to get that. This is talking about bringing the mortal Israel, that one-third that goes into slavery, not to forget the 10% holy stump where the Bible actually says in Isaiah 4 and Isaiah 6, Seven out of eight of them are going to be female and children. Okay. That one-third remnant of Israel being brought back out of slavery from Baghdad, Tyre, Lebanon, Sidon, Lebanon, Beirut, Gaza, Syria, Damascus, um, Mosul, maybe Turkey and Iran. Uh, Israel is about to be taken into slavery. It's not an imminent return of Jesus. It's an imminent sudden destruction on Israel. I'm not calling for it. That's what the Bible teaches. Unless they denounce Gog the Assyrian possessed by the Antichrist and bow before Jesus during the fifth seal and not persecute the followers of Jesus Christ and round up all the holy Bibles. But that's not going to happen. But you should pray for that. But yes, here in Isaiah 61... It's talking about Jesus. You might say, yeah, it is. And he can heal us now. Yes, he can. There's healing power that's available now. But that's not the primary thing that this is talking about. It's talking about what all of these verses 1 through 3 are talking about. The building up and reviving Israel after the time of Jacob's trouble. And, and, uh, and they will help the Lord rule the planet. And they will also, the sons of Levi, 
mortals who didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, those left alive after the battle, uh, after the uh, uh, time of Jacob's trouble, and they don't have the mark of the beast, those sons of Levi will serve as priests, that's Ezekiel 40 through 48, will serve as a priest to God uh, and Lord God Jesus, his son, and offer a pleasant uh, sacrifice to the Lord in Jerusalem. And there'll be feast days, and there'll be animals sacrificed by the thousands. And people don't understand that. Why, is, why are we going to have sacrifices during the millennium? Because Father wants it. He's never said he's not going to have sacrifices during the millennium reign of Jesus. He is. Jesus is the high priest, and we are also priests. And we are going to, the nation shall come to Jesus in Jerusalem, and Jesus will ensure that not only is there worship going on to him, but also to his Father. And he will supervise the sacrifices to his Father, Yah, the Holy One of Israel. It's not like we stop thinking about Father during the millennium. That's what it's all about. A pleasant offering to the Lord, Yah, the Holy One of Israel. Jesus will rule the planet and, uh, and cause the people of the world to bow before his Father. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, verse 2 of Isaiah 61. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. These are things that Jesus is coming back to do. Are you with me? To proclaim liberty to Israel's captives. To, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, maybe some Christians that aren't martyred, who are left in prison, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, that's actually done, really, at the seventh trumpet at the throne room of God. Excuse me. Yes, at the seventh trumpet in Daniel 7, at the throne room of God, Father makes a decision. And then he spends the next four to six weeks of the bowls of wrath orchestrating the fall of the beast kingdom. But the day of vengeance of our God is mentioned in Revelation 19 in the first few verses. Might even be verse 2. Let's look. I really don't know. Computer is a little overwhelmed right now. You may be too. Come on, computer. You can do it. If anybody wants to send me uh, butt loads of money so I can buy a new computer, hey, just let me know. We'll, we'll work something out. All right, Revelation 19. I'm just curious. I really don't know if it's verse 2. Talking about the, uh, boy, the computer's memory is full. So we may not be able to do this, and we may not even be able to get back to that PNG file. It's trying. Here we go. Come on, computer. But anyways, the day of vengeance. Here we go. Uh, yes, it is. Hallelujah. I really didn't know. I knew it was around there. There you go. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged. That means the battle of the great day of God Almighty is over. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. That's that number of Christian martyrs that must take place. That's not a rapture in Revelation 7. That Those are martyrs before the throne room dressed in white. It is, brothers and sisters. Revelation 7 is exactly what the fifth seal passage in Revelation 6 said it is. It's martyrdom. And there we go. 42 months of Satan making war on those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But the day of vengeance is during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, which lasts for more than one day, according to Isaiah 28. That's interesting. Isaiah 61 2 is Revelation 19 2. It's more than one day, and it is the battle of the great day of God Almighty. To comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion. See, so 
Again, this is all about healing the brokenhearted and binding up the wounds of his people when he comes as commander of the Lord's army to start the battle of the great day of God Almighty and the millennium. Are you catching on? To console those who mourn in Cleveland. No, to console those who mourn in Zion. We're talking about mortals who aren't changed. Okay. This could be the 10% holy stump coming out of Bethany, coming out of uh, Isaiah 16's Fords of the Arnon hiding place, uh, eventually coming back from slavery, that one-third of Israel. Jesus will wipe away their tears to give them beauty for ashes. Because remember, this is a desolate Middle East, and most of the cities of the world will be desolate. I mean, there ain't nothing but ashes left. This is the purification of the stream of fire and brimstone that will come out of the nostrils of Jesus Christ. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the tree of life, the green olive tree with lovely and good fruit that Jesus is the root of. The planting of the Lord. This is what he's doing during the millennium. He's planting. He's replanting Israel. So it will be a pleasant offering before his father, Yah. It's the replanting of Israel. That replanting has nothing to do with 1948. Now, 1948 was the work of God. But that's, what, that's not what this planting of the Lord is talking about. This is during the millennium second coming of Jesus Christ when he brings that one-third of Israel back from slavery and the two-thirds uh, father ensures that they die let's be honest during the time of Jacob's trouble that he may be glorified that's Ezekiel 39 lingo why father is doing all of this that the world may know who he is once and for all so this is what event that Psalm 147 is talking about and when you read about Jesus healing in uh, the, the New Testament, you need to realize that the primary understanding or fulfillment of what Jesus is talking about is about his kingdom. Not about these last 2,000 years, even though healing is available. Psalm 147, uh, all three verses, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. Are we talking about the millennium? Yes, for it is pleasant. The same word is used in the Bible. I wish I could find it. That talks about um, the sons of Levi offering a pleasant offering to the Lord during the millennium, which is Ezekiel 40 through 48. Same event. Uh, I'm almost afraid with my computer to try to find it. I'll do a quick search. Pleasant. How do you spell it? Is that pleasant or is this pleasant? Where was it at? Isaiah is always my first choice to go to. For the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. Ooh, okay, that's talking a lot about uh, Isaiah 5 7 is talking a lot about what we're talking about in this lesson. Um Well, I don't, I don't see it. I don't remember where it is. Okay. And I just talked about it in a, uh, a lesson I've done in the last two weeks. All right. Psalm 147 continued. Verse 2. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcast of Israel. Is this event talking about a past event? Like, say, after the 70 years of captivity in Babylon? No, it's not. It's not. This is about the coming of the Lord. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This is the outcast of Israel that are being brought back from Baghdad, Babylon the great city, being brought back from Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, Iran, anywhere else that they're, they're taken to. This is bringing them back. Most of Israel's slaves during the time of Jacob's trouble will go to their neighbors, most of them. 
That's why Jesus threshes, we're told in Isaiah 27, 12, from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. And that's mainly where this one third of Israel is going to go into captivity. Now, some of them will even go as far north as Izmir in that area in Turkey. You know that from scripture. But this, the majority, will be in the zone that Jesus personally threshes with his armies of heaven. Did you know that? So that tells you where most of the, the, the Israeli slaves are going to go to during um, the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. The wrath of the Lord of hosts on his people, which is phase one of the day of the Lord. Phase two being when Jesus returns at the seventh bowl and administers the wrath of the Lamb day of his fierce anger and indignation, which is what we are not appointed for. Mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. I know you wish that I was talking about the uh, 42 months of Christian persecution or the uh, time of Jacob's trouble, but that's not. That's not the wrath that we are not appointed for. It's the wrath of the Lamb at his coming, the day of vengeance on his enemies and adversaries. That's what we are not appointed for. Now, we're never appointed for God's wrath. So let me back up and rephrase that. We're never appointed, but you will be here during the time of Jacob's trouble. You will be here to give testimony during the time of Christian martyrdom when Satan is here making war against you. You will be here for that. Get ready. I know you don't like talking about it and teaching your children about it, but it's coming. You don't have to talk about it every day, but you need to teach your family that it's coming and make sure they understand what the falling away is and how Satan comes first to deceive, if possible, your children. They're going to go to college. They're going to come home with the mark of the beast. They're going to go to school. They're going to come home with the mark of the beast. They're going to go to the bowling alley. Next thing you know, they come home with the mark of the beast. And you're like, oh my God, I never taught them not to take it. It is more important here in 2019 that you teach your children about the mark of the beast. You teach your grandchildren about the mark of the beast. You teach that more than anything else. Except for the love of Jesus and his father and the brethren. Other than that, there's nothing else more important than teaching about the deception, the great falling away that's coming. So Father can find out who the real followers of Jesus are and identify the fake Christians and mark them for destruction, just like he's marking two-thirds of Israel. Now, does that mean two-thirds of Christians are going to be killed by Jesus and they will fall away from the faith? I have no idea. The Bible doesn't say the percentage of those who fall away. I hope it's not that high. Now, two-thirds of Israel is going to be purged away in the refining process, says Isaiah 1, Ezekiel 13, and uh, Ezekiel 4 and 5. I don't wish it to be so, but there's going to be huge numbers of clergy, huge numbers of, of Christian flock members who fall for this fake Messiah. People of color. People of color who are followers of Jesus Christ. You have family members who are taking part in a movement nowadays that is very anti the people of God, very anti Israel. And, and a lot of men of color are teaching their communities that the people who exist now in Israel are not only marked for destruction which a lot of them are, that's correct, but they're not even the people of God. They're not true Israel. That's a lie. Father wants true Israel. Uh, I shouldn't say true Israel. He wants the Israel of the Bible in Israel at the time of the end so he can purge them right, them, right then and there. So stop saying the people who live there now are not Israel. Now, granted, two out of three of them are about to to die at the hands of Yah, the Holy One of Israel, and there'll be one third left. But to make it sound like true Israel are 90% black is not true. And the only reason I even bring this up is because there's groups of people who claim to read the Word of God 
who are being set up almost by Father himself. They're being set up when Satan is cast to earth and, and he uh, has this anti-Israel attitude after the fifth seal and anti-Christians. They're being set up. They're, they're, they're not being drawn to Jesus. They're being drawn to Yah, the Holy One of Israel, but not Jesus. And they're also not understanding who Yah, the Holy One of Israel, is. And they're not understanding how that his people are the ones who live there now. It's hard for me to, to, to say it correctly. And I may not be making any sense right now, but there's groups of people who supposedly read uh, the Word of God, especially the Old Testament. They're, they're going back to the Old Testament and they're getting in that Yah, the Holy One of Israel fever. But they're not, they're being set up, if you will, to fall away from Jesus. They are. That's the best way I can describe it. So be careful. People of color, all you beautiful grandmas and grandpas, you know what I'm talking about. You're seeing it in your younger generation. And these men who are preaching the Old Testament, standing on the corner, and they don't talk much about Jesus. They talk a lot about Yah, the Holy One of Israel, but they don't really know who he is, and they don't really understand his plan. And they're just so proud to teach people of color that you're the true Israel. And there's coming a time when the white man must pay for his sins. And Yah, the Holy One of Israel, who's black, is going to come and help us destroy the yoke of the white man. I mean, there's it sounds crazy, but there, I'm telling you, this movement is happening. Now, what percentage of uh, followers of Jesus Christ who will become immortal and be heirs of the kingdom are people of color? A lot. So I understand that, okay? Um, and I'm not trying to say otherwise. And I hope it doesn't sound racial what I'm saying now. I'm trying to warn you because I love you. I'm trying to warn Israel. I'm trying to warn people of color. There's a movement, and, a, and many of you know what I'm talking about, that's happening in Detroit, in Cleveland, in Chicago, in Atlanta, in Philadelphia, in New York. In L.A., there's this movement that's happening, and it, it seems good at first because people are acknowledging Yah, the Holy One of Israel. And the next thing you know, they just have this hatred towards white people, and they try to say that the people in Israel today have nothing to do with true Israel, and they must be removed so us people of color can move in. I mean, they, they're not getting it. They're being set up when the mes fake Messiah shows up and begins drawing the world to him. And he's going to be working signs, wonders, and miracles with his false prophet, and healing, true physical healing of people's limbs and eyesight. And he's working all these miracles. People who really don't know the entire word of God and don't have the Holy Spirit residing in them are going to fall away from Jesus. It's the, uh, enough said. Enough said about that. But the people who live there now are the apple of God's eye. Pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. Yes, they're about to do some really evil things to the Christians there. But Father Yah is watching you and to see your spirit. And do you care for his people like he does? Because it saddens him greatly that he is about to orchestrate their death. Two out of every three people. He doesn't want to do it. He's begging them to wake up to the truth. He knows he has to do it. He knows he has to, but he doesn't want to do it. Do you? Are you going to be praying for those people that Father had? I mean, think about it. His own, the seed of Jacob, he's got to kill them. Or at least orchestrate their deaths by bringing Satan amongst them and passing through their land. And he has to do it. He doesn't want to do it. So your attitude towards the apple of his eye is real important. So don't get caught up in all this Israel bashing. Do you understand? 
You're going to become, that should be your goal, to become true Israel. That shall live with Yah, the Holy One of Israel, forever. And be led by Jesus, God the Son. Hallelujah. What do I have here at the bottom to end the lesson? I imagine this study was an eye-opener for many. Yes, Jesus wants to draw from God's power now for healing and repentance. But Psalm 147.3 and all of its matches in the New Testament are talking about a specific event in our near future. It is the day that Father brings Jesus to set him up as ruler of the planet from Jerusalem. The name of Jesus' kingdom is found in the book of Micah, chapter 4, verse 8, and explained in all of Micah 4. Please read all of Micah chapter 4, as well as all of the chapter of these four, uh, all of the verses of these four chapters, to include all of Micah 4. Jesus shall rise up at the pouring of the seventh bowl. He will muster his immortal army by means of the resurrection rapture, uh, mentioned in Ezekiel 37. That's what that is and use it to trample and thresh Jesus' enemies and adversaries. This is called the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Then Jesus will spend the early years of the millennial period gathering all of his people Israel who are left alive but did not take the mark of the beast. Jesus' bride will be made up of immortals and mortal Israel. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you. I hope at least some of you stayed with me throughout all of it, or at least watched it in parts. And I can't wait to see you next time. God bless.